What do people get for all their hard work under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth never changes. The sun rises and the sun sets, then hurries around to rise again. The wind blows south and then turns north. Around and around it goes, blowing in circles. Rivers run into the sea, but the sea is never full. Then the water returns again to the rivers and flows out again to the sea. Everything is wearisome beyond description. No matter how much we see, we are never satisfied. No matter how much we hear, we are not content. Everything is meaningless. Completely meaningless. So what's the purpose? Take your Bibles with me today and turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Let me just reiterate, uh, have a few minutes this morning. Let me reiterate just a few of the announcements. Really want you, if you can, to come to our dinner on Thursday night. I know it's a school dinner, but uh, I want to encourage you. Great time, wonderful spaghetti dinner. And all of that benefits our school. Great time of fellowship. And then they've been working on a wonderful program. You don't have anything to do on Thursday. We would encourage you to come out and uh, a partner with us. Uh, God is enabling us to reach many families through our school. And we rejoice in that. And we continue that partnership. And so if you're looking for something to do on Thursday or guys, you just want to take your wife out for a fancy meal. Let me encourage you to, uh, to come out on Thursday. I believe you can purchase those tickets at the back of the auditorium. And uh, next week, we will be uh, participating and, uh, and culminating our Operation Christmas Child. And so please be working on your boxes. And we're going to have a special time during the service in which we're going to bring those forward and we're going to dedicate those. And we're going to pray and trust God, not only to bless the lives of hundreds of boys and girls around the world, but we're going to trust God to uh, reach many for Jesus Christ this year. And so I trust If you haven't picked up your box, as uh, Brad and Kelly already said, I would encourage you to do so. Uh, What a great way for us to uh, minister to boys and girls around the world. Well, Hollywood Community Church is an incredibly diverse community of believers. Uh, We are diverse in so many different ways. Uh, First of all, we are ethnically diverse. As you uh, look around the congregation, we have uh, uh, people from all different colors and all different nations. I just spoke in our uh, Spanish congregation in Cuentro just a few moments ago, and I think we have like 10 or 15 different nations uh, represented in our Spanish congregation. In our English congregation, we do as well. I mean, we are a congregation made up of Hispanics and and blacks and whites and Caribbean and Asians, and uh, I'm sure there's people that I didn't think of, and we rejoice and uh, we're proud, uh, spiritually speaking, we're proud of our unity. We're politically diverse. Uh, We have people on both sides of the political aisle in our congregation. We are economically diverse. Uh, We have people in our congregation that are jobless and and, uh, and then we have others in our congregation that are economically comfortable. They're extremely comfortable. We are, we are fanatically diverse. You say, Brian, what do you mean by that? Well, we have fans of the University of Miami. We have fans of the University of Florida. We have fans from Florida State University. And those that are really spiritual are fans of the Ohio State Buckeyes who won last night <laughs> about midnight. Um, if I look a little tired, it's because I stayed up and watched the entire game uh, last night. We are, we are extremely diverse. But there is another diversity which we do not mention often. I'm sure there's many of them, but there's one that we do not mention. And all of us today fall in one of those two groups. You say, Brian, to whom are you speaking today? Well, every single one of us here today are either wise or we're foolish. Let me say that again. Every single one of us here today are wise or we're we're foolish. Now, quite frankly, no one likes being called a fool. And I certainly am not going to stand up here and call anyone by that name today. A fool is generally considered uh, as a silly person. 
uh, one who lacks judgment or common sense. Surprisingly, not sure whether you know this or not, but the term foolish or one of its derivatives is frequently used in the Bible. As a matter of fact, the term fool or word similar occurs at least 145 times in Scripture. Nine of those times are found in the passage of Scripture that we are studying today. And so if you have your Bibles, we're in Ecclesiastes chapter 10. We're going to read basically verses 1 through 14. Going to read out of a different version today. Going to read out of the ESV. And so follow along if that's not the version that you have in your hand. If you want to follow along on the screen, you can do so. Follow along in whatever version that you have. Solomon says this, Dead flies make the perfumer's ointment give off a stench. So a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. A wise man's heart inclines him to the right, but a fool's heart to the left. Even when a fool walks on the road, he lacks sense. And he says to everyone that he is a fool. If the anger of the ruler rises against you, do not leave your place. For calmness will lay great offenses to rest. Jump down to verse 8. He who digs a pit will fall into it. And a serpent will bite him who breaks through a wall. He who quarries stones is hurt by them. And he who splits logs is endangered by them. If the iron is blunt and one does not sharpen the edge, he must use more strength. But wisdom helps one to succeed. If the serpent bites before it is charmed, there's no advantage to the charmer. The words of a wise man's mouth win him favor, but the lips of a fool consume him. In the beginning of the words of his mouth, or excuse me, the beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness, and the end of his talk is evil madness. A fool multiplies words. Though no man knows what is to be, and who can tell what will be after him? Let's pray together. Father, as we look in your word today, I pray that you would examine our hearts. Uh, Father, obviously, none of us like to even admit that there's a chance that we're being foolish in certain aspects of our life. And so, Lord, I I just pray this morning that the Holy Spirit of God would take the Word of God and teach these verses to us today. Help us to walk away with an understanding of what Solomon meant when he wrote these words, but even more importantly, what the Holy Spirit of God intended when he inspired Solomon to write these words. Father, as Solomon examines life and as he's striving to chase after, to pursue the right things, help us to realize this morning the folly, the the foolishness of chasing after that which does not please you. Help us to understand this morning the the folly, the the foolishness of acting in ways and, and thinking in ways and demonstrating attitudes that do not please you. And so, Lord, I pray that each and every one of us, as we are graded, as we are judged by you, as you look down upon us, Lord, I'm so grateful, first of all, that if we've trusted Jesus Christ, that we're covered by the blood of Jesus. But Lord, I pray that the words that we say and the actions that we do would be wise in your sight. Lord, help us to submit to the Holy Spirit of God so that he can help us to demonstrate godly wisdom. Teach us from your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ecclesiastes, along with Job, Psalms, uh, Proverbs, and Song of Solomon, form a part of Scripture that, that we call wisdom literature. Uh, wisdom literature uh, is very poetic and expressive in nature. 
Uh, wisdom literature deals with everyday life events. There, there are certain books in the Bible that are, that are extremely doctrinal, that are extremely theological, and then there are books that are extremely practical, that, that deal with, with events that you and I live with and deal with on a regular basis. Wisdom literature, these, these five books, seems to meet us right where we are. As a matter of fact, that's why we feel so comfortable reading the book of Psalms. And we feel so comfortable reading the book of Proverbs because we're reading about things that we are living on a regular basis. How to discipline an unruly child. How to teach children what they need to know to survive as an adult. The dangers to the community of gossip and slander. The need for hard work and providing for the necessities of life. Why wicked people seem to prosper. You ever wonder that? Why do wicked people prosper and it seems that godly people are suffering? And the arrogance of sudden wealth. Those are some of the themes that are dealt with in wisdom literature. And so as we sit back and, and study this passage, it's important for us to, uh, to sit back and uh, examine our lives. The chapter that we're dealing with this morning is different than much of the book of Ecclesiastes. As a matter of fact, as, we, as we've gone through it, you'll see that, that seemingly as we come to chapter 10, the, the genre seems to change. And, 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 and in this chapter, Solomon is writing very similar to the way he wrote in the book of Proverbs. Uh, you might sit back and say, yeah, Brian, I noticed that as, as, as I've read through the chapter. It seems, like, it, it seems like this chapter belongs in the book of Proverbs. Well, it's very similar. The genre is very similar. Uh, a proverb is a comparison. A proverb is a saying that gives wise or moralistic advice. Well, in today's chapter, Solomon gives at least 17 different axioms. He gives at least 17 different adages that give advice as to how we should live. And much of today's chapter deals with how not to live like a fool. Now, if we're honest, all of us struggle with that at times. Because there are times that all of us demonstrate some sort of foolishness. And so, you know, don't turn me off and say, okay, Brian, he's talking about somebody else. You're not talking about me. No, all of us at one point in our life demonstrate, maybe even now, demonstrate some degree of foolishness in our life. So I want to challenge you. As you look at this passage of Scripture, uh, look at it as it were a mirror and examine your light or your life in light of God's Word. Throughout wisdom literature, the term fool doesn't speak about one's intelligence because you might sit back and say, hey, Brian, you know what? I know you're not talking about me because I have a college degree. Or, Brian, I know you're not talking about me because I have an IQ of this number right here. Or, Brian, I know you're not talking about me because I can remember almost everything I hear. I certainly am not foolish. I certainly do not live like a fool. Well, when Solomon uses the term fool in wisdom literature, he's not speaking about a person's intellectual ability. He's speaking about a person's spiritual condition. And here's what Solomon is saying. Solomon is saying that, that it is very easy for someone to be intellectually smart, but to be spiritually foolish. It's very easy for someone to, to demonstrate a certain level of intellectualism, and yet at the same time, be a fool. So as we look at this passage of Scripture, let's examine our life. Point number one, so very simple. And yet as you take this chapter in its entirety and you try to synthesize the chapter, here's what Solomon says. Solomon says, first of all, don't be foolish. Don't be foolish. Nine times, as I mentioned a few moments ago, nine times in this chapter, Solomon uses the word fool foolish or folly. As a matter of fact, I'd encourage you to go home and underline each and every time 
that is used. His warning is simple and it's straightforward. He looks at me and he looks at you and he says this, Brian, don't be a fool. Brian, do not be foolish. As I mentioned a few moments ago, it's very easy for a person to be intellectually smart, yet spiritually foolish. I'd go so far as to say that a person could be a genius and a fool at the exact same time. As a matter of fact, you might know someone who is unbelievably smart intellectually, yet their life is an absolute disaster. Their intellectual ability is not helping them live a life that honors God, live an ordered life. So this morning, let's examine our actions and our attitudes in the light of God's Word to make sure that we are living wisely and not foolishly. Notice, if you notice in the passage, the first thing that Solomon says is this. He says, a fool will destroy his reputation. Notice verse 1 once again. Dead flies make the perfumer's ointment give off a stench. So a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. You and I can, can visualize what Solomon is describing. Here's what Solomon is saying. He's saying, you live the lid off of an expensive, sweet-smelling perfume, especially in a hot, dry, arid place like in the Middle East. It doesn't take long for that sweet-smelling perfume to attract flies, which fall into the perfume and die. Here's what Solomon is saying then. The result is that instead, this this expensive, sweet-smelling perfume, instead of giving off a pleasant smell, now gives off what? It gives off stench. Why? Because death is in the bottle. This perfume that used to smell beautiful now absolutely stinks. Now, Solomon is not recommending what type of cologne and perfume you and I go out and buy. He's not saying, don't buy cologne that smells like dead flies, even though I would, I would recommend that this morning. That's not what Solomon is saying. He is, he is applying this to individuals. And, and here's what Solomon is saying. Although some people give off a good smell, Although some people's actions and attitudes used to be pleasant and you would look at them and you would enjoy being around them and you would admire them, their life has now begun to stink just like dead flies. What is he saying? He's saying their reputation is ruined. Hey, hey, here's what he says. He says, a good reputation is takes years to build, but a good reputation can be destroyed in one instant. Think about that. A good reputation takes years to build, but it can be destroyed in one instant. Let me illustrate. Anybody here ever built a house of cards? That, that's a really frustrating game. I don't know why anybody would want to do that. But, but you take these cards and you, 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 know, you put two together, you lean one up against the other, and then you take a third one and you lean the third one up against that one, and then you take the fourth one, and all of a sudden you have a room, and then you build a room beside it. And then if you're really brave, you begin adding cards on top of cards. And if you're good, I've never been able to do it, but if you're good, you're, being, you're able to build this house of cards. I think we have a picture. This house of cards that takes a long time to build and yet if you've ever built a house of cards and it took you a long time to build that house of cards how long does it take to destroy it just one puff one bump of the table one simple seemingly innocent act causes the whole house to fall down Solomon is saying the same thing He's saying you and I can have a life that has demonstrated a good reputation, but in one instant, one wrong decision, one incorrect act can bring this good reputation, to bring this house completely falling down. And let me me take just a moment and address our young people around the auditorium. Young people and and adults alike, but specifically our young people, no doubt one of your most valuable treasures is your testimony. 
and you can lose it so very quickly. Justin and Mark would tell you that, that whenever they were in their early teenager years and they were you know, starting to go out on dates and do all of that, every time they left, I believe without exception, but almost every time they left, right before they'd walk out the door, I'd look at them and I would say one word. Remember this word as you're out on your date tonight. Testimony. Testimony. It got to the place that uh, they'd be walking out the door and I'd say, hey, Justin, hold a second. One word. He'd say, I know, Dad. Testimony. Testimony. Or Mark would say the exact same thing. Why is that? Because one stupid action can ruin a lifetime of good events. You can lose it so quickly. Hanging with the wrong friends. Making bad decisions. Filling your mind with wrong thoughts. All of those can lead to actions which produce stench in our life. They can make your life stink. Man, that is so foolish. At the end of the message, we'll see uh, 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 that wisdom causes us to examine our lives, our actions, and our attitudes. But being unwise causes us to make unwise decisions. Think about it today, and please nobody yell anything out, but all of us can think of former presidents, athletes, and even pastors that made foolish mistakes that hound them for the rest of their lives. A Japanese proverb says this, the reputation of a thousand years may be determined by the conduct of one hour. Think about that. Ecclesiastes 7.1 says it this way, a good name is better than a precious ointment. So, so here's what Solomon said, a fool makes bad decisions that ruins his or her reputation. He says a second thing in the passage, he says, a fool does wrong instead of right. Notice verse 2. He says it this way. A wise man's heart inclines him to the right, but a fool's heart to the left. Uh, in the ancient world, the right hand was a place of power and honor. Uh, in contrast, the left hand represented weakness and represented rejection. Many people in the ancient world considered the left side to be unlucky. The English word sinister. All of us are familiar with the English word sinister. The English word sinister comes from a Latin word which literally means on the left hand. And so with that Middle Eastern form of thought in mind, here's what Solomon says. He says, a wise man's heart leans to the right, but a fool's heart leans to the left. Uh, let me say it this way. A wise man's heart leads towards righteousness, while an unwise man's heart leans towards leftness. No, I just made that work up, word up. <laughs> Leans towards what? Leans towards wickedness is what Solomon is saying. L listen, notice the verse once again. A wise man's heart inclines him to the right, but a fool's heart to the left. What does that teach us? Listen, I want you to catch this. This is in your notes. Foolishness comes from the heart. Foolishness, that, that act of foolishness that we demonstrate, the, those, those improper decisions, the, the things that we say that we shouldn't say, the things that we do that we shouldn't do, where in the world does that come from? Sometimes I'm sure you act in a way that even surprises you or you give in to temptations and you sit back and think, my word, how in the world did I give in to that temptation? You know where it comes from? It comes from your hearts and it comes from my hearts. Solomon said it this way in Proverbs 23, 7, for as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And ladies, we also could say, as a woman thinks in her heart, so is she. Jesus said it this way in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 19, 
For out of the hearts come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, witness, and slander. Listen, all of that comes from where? It comes from the hearts. That's why, let me pause for a second, that's why it's so important for us to have Jesus where? In our hearts. Listen, religion simply changes us from the outside. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ that changes us from the inside. And an outside change doesn't doesn't change the inside. But an inside change, what? Changes the outside. That's what Solomon is describing in the passage. You and I need to be changed, not from the outside in. We need to be changed, what? From the inside out. Here's the second thing that I wrote down. He says this, wisdom and foolishness reveal themselves in your behavior. Notice verse 3. He says this, even when the fool walks on the road, he lacks sense. And he says to everyone that he is a fool. Let me show you what I'm saying. You don't have to be around certain people to know what, what is important to them, right? If you're around Kevin Allen long enough, you know that Kevin loves to sing. Does he not? Kevin loves to sing. If you're around Mike Hall, you know that Mike loves Southern gospel music. Mike lives and breathes Southern gospel music. Well, he lives and breathes Claudia, God first Claudia, and Southern gospel music third, I'm sure, right? Um, if you're around Matt Sinelli, Matt Sinelli loves to have fun. If you're around uh, uh, Carlos and Gloria, they love the Florida State Seminoles, absolutely love them, right? You're not around them long, you know that. If you're around Vicky, you know that she loves me because she demonstrates that <laughs> on a regular basis. Isn't that right? Listen, here's what Solomon is saying. You don't have to be around a fool very long to realize that a fool demonstrates what? Foolishness. I, I love what verse 3 says. Even when a fool walks on the road, doing something so seemingly innocuous, something so seemingly innocent. He or she is just living their life. They demonstrate what? They demonstrate foolishness. His actions say to everyone, why there goes a fool. Notice, who's the last person to know whether he or she is foolish? The fool himself, right? Uh, I mean, the fool has what? The fool has fooled him or herself into thinking they're not foolish when everyone else around them thinks, boy, that person acts like a fool. Solomon is telling us, listen, wisdom and foolishness reveal themselves in your behavior. So, so let me ask you a question this morning. What do your actions say about you? What do your choices say about you? The, the people with whom you live, the people with whom you work, would they look at you and say, why, that person is wise? Or is that person a fool? They probably would never say it that way, but maybe in their mind they would think, boy, that person sure acts foolish. Let me give you a, a third thing. The third thing is this, a fool loses control of his or her emotions. Notice verse 4, if the anger of the ruler rises against you, do not leave your place for, do not leave your place, comma, for calmness will lay great offenses to rest. Uh, here Solomon speaks of the importance of learning to keep your emotions in check. I find it very interesting that the verse speaks of someone, specifically a ruler, who gets mad at you first. Someone who is upset at you, and he uses the illustration of a, of a ruler, someone that is in government. You didn't initiate the confrontation, you are simply responding to the con confrontation. Here's what, here's what Solomon says, fools get drawn into a 
confrontation. They didn't even necessarily start it, but they get drawn into uh, the confrontation. He says, man, fools lose control of their emotions. Ecclesiastes 7.9 says this, be not quick in your spirit to become angry, for anger lodges in the bosom of fools. Proverbs 15.1, a soft answer turns away wrath, but soft words stir up anger. Then put the verse on the screen, James chapter 1 and verse 17. James says, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Let me ask you today, do you get angry quick? Do you, do you lose your temper at the drop of a hat? Do, do you say things that, that you regret saying and you have to go back and either apologize for it or try to act really, really, really sweet to the person that you treated incorrectly? Solomon is saying, listen, those are the actions of a foolish person and not the actions of a wise person. He gives a, a fourth characteristic in the chapter. He says, fourthly, a fool is careless. Uh, the next three verses, verses 8 through 11, are, are humorous to me. I know, I know I have a weird warped sense of humor, but as I read through these, I can't help but laugh. Uh, these verses speak of, uh, of various calamities that happen to a fool. I'm not going to read them again. In verse 8, it says that a fool digs a hole, and then what? He falls into the hole that he or she dug. Listen, a fool puts his hand through a wall he shouldn't have, and gets what? And gets bitten by a snake who's on the other side. Verse 9, a fool is working in a quarry, and he's not wise, so the stones that he's working with fall on him. A fool, a fool is chopping logs, and one of those logs flies up and hits you right in the face. Now, now, why that's so funny is because all of those things sound like something that I would do. As a matter of fact, all, some of those things are things that I have done in the past, all right? Listen, here's the admonition. Be really careful putting a power tool in Brian's hand, all right? Because Brian is probably going to chop off a limb or maybe even worse. Don't assign me a job on a roof because there's a good chance that I'm going to fall off of the roof. Don't have me dig the hole because there's a good chance I'm going to fall in the hole. Listen, here's the application. The application is not don't give Brian a power tool. And the application is not even necessarily be careful with the holes you dig or the power tools that you put in your hand. Here's the application. A fool is careless and a fool is hurt by his or her own carelessness. Uh, let me say it again. Uh, a fool is careless and as a result is hurt by his or her own carelessness. But listen, he's applying it not in physical things, but he's applying it, I believe, in spiritual terms. Just, just as a builder can be hurt by his or her carelessness, a gun owner can be injured by his or her carelessness. A believer can be spiritually hurt by his or her carelessness. You see, it's a fool that is careless with dangerous things. It is a fool that is careless with spiritual things. You might sit back and say, Brian, man, I'd never fall off a roof. I'd never fall into a hole. I'd never allow a log to fly up in the air and hit me in the head. Man, good for you if that's you. But do you play with temptation? Do you get just as close as you can to temptation and think, hey, you know what? I can overcome it. I can control it. I'm not going to allow it to control me. If you are, you're careless. Do you do you look at pornography guys every now and then and think, hey, you know what, wait a second, Brian, pornography is a victimless crime. All right, I'm not hurting anybody. 
Man, you're playing with fire. You're being negligent. Are you prayerless? You see, prayerlessness will result in spiritual weakness. Are you unfaithful in meeting together with God's people? Because unfaithful, moms and dads, listen to this, unfaithful church attendance today will cause your children to be disinterested in the things of God. You see, the habits that you form today, the godliness that you demonstrate today is the godliness, Lord willing, that is going to be incorporated in the lives of your kids. And if you are negligent in spiritual things, if you're careless in spiritual things, Solomon's saying, man, that is a foolish step to take. Don't be spiritually careless. It it always amazes me how, how some people are so detailed in certain areas of their life. Man, they're OCD in their finances, they're OCD in the way they take care of their car, they're OCD in the way, and, and I get it because I am like that, believe it or not, in, in certain areas. But they're unbelievably careless in the most important thing in their life. They're unbelievably careless, careless when it comes to their relationship with the Lord their walk with the Lord, and the spirituality of their family. And for some reason, we don't take that seriously, and we're careless. Solomon says, don't be negligent. Don't be careless. Fools are careless. Let me give you a a fifth thing. He says, fools do not control their tongue. Verse 12, the words of a wise man's mouth win him favor but the lips of a fool consume him. The beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness. The end of his talk is evil madness. A fool multiplies words, though no man knows what is to be and who can tell what will be after him. Verses 12 through 14, Solomon describes the destructive power of the tongue. Let me just give you a couple of of descriptions that Solomon makes of, of the tongue of a foolish person. He's first of all, um, a, a fool speaks destructive words. Verse 12, the words of a wise man's mouth win him favor, but the lips of a fool consume him. Listen, a fool blurts out what is ever on his mind or her mind. A fool doesn't care who he hurts or offends. Hey, you know what? It's just my opinion. I'm allowed to say whatever I want. And a fool does not care who he hurts or offends. Man, that happens so often in a marriage. Husbands and wives, be so very careful what you say at home. You know that old adage, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words never hurt me. That's not true. Because I sit with people almost every week who have been unbelievably hurt by words. Words, the words of the foolish are destructive. They, they destroy someone else and they eventually come back and consume you. Proverbs 18.7, a fool's mouth is his ruin and his lips are a snare to his soul. They destroy him. Solomon says, secondly, that a fool speaks unreasonable words. Verse 13, the beginning of his mouth is foolishness. And the end is absolute madness. Here's what Solomon says. What that person says doesn't make any sense. The longer this person talks, the crazier it becomes. You ever sit with a person that just incessantly will not shut up? Don't look at anybody right now, okay? I don't want you to look at anybody. All right? This person talks incessantly, and what they say makes no sense whatsoever. The only person it makes sense to is them. Listen, their, their, their words are unreasonable words. The more he speaks, the more she speaks, the more this person lets everyone around them know that he or she is a fool. Ecclesiastes 5.2 We studied this a few weeks ago. Let your words be few, Solomon says. For a dream comes with much business and a fool's voice with many words. Proverbs 29, 11, a fool vents all of his feelings. 
but a wise man holds them back. Here's the next thing a fool speaks, uncontrolled words. A fool multiplies words. Proverbs 10, 19, when words are many, transgression is not lacking. But whoever restrains his lips is prudent. And the last one is this, a fool speaks boastful words. Notice the latter part of verse 14. It seemingly doesn't make sense, but here's what Solomon is saying. Though a man knows, or though no man knows what is to be, and who can tell him what will be after him. Hey, here's what he's saying. A fool makes groundless predictions. A fool is constantly boasting about his or her abilities, yet his or her actions never seem to back up what he or she is saying. Did you ever meet someone like that? That, that man, if you, you, your first impression of them is, man, this person knows absolutely everything. It doesn't matter what topic they're talking about, they're an expert on that topic until you realize that they're blowing hot air. And they don't know uh, everything that they're saying. And quite frankly, they're an expert intellectually, but they're a disaster practically. They're boastful. Their words are empty. Their words are boastful. Make sure that's not you. The writer of Proverbs says this, Proverbs 27 too, Let another person praise you and not your own mouth. A stranger and not your own lips. And we could go on and on because the Bible speaks very often about fools. Psalm 14 and verse 1 says this, a fool says in his heart, there is no God. Proverbs 15 and verse 20, a fool despises his mother. Proverbs 28, 26, those who trust in their own insight are fools. Proverbs says it this way, don't be wise in your own eyes. Don't trust in yourself. Trust in God. So let me ask you, church, how wise are you? Uh, maybe I better ask the question a different way. How foolish are you? Do, do your actions, do your attitudes characterize you as a wise person or a foolish person? Let me share one more point. I'm almost done. Solomon says this. He says, first of all, don't be a fool. But, but the Bible gives a positive response to that because the response to not being foolish is to be what? Is to be wise. And so the Bible says, don't act like a fool. Rather, act like a wise person. The Bible's comments on fools, folly, and foolishness are not limited to the Old Testament. One of the strongest passages in the New Testament also deals with the importance of choosing wisdom over foolishness. I want to go there quickly before we close. Would you go in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5? Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 18, because the Apostle Paul, several hundred, not thousands years later, or probably about a thousand years later, not quite, spoke about foolishness and wisdom. Ephesians chapter 5, let me, let me read these verses, verses 15 through 18. I'll put them up on the screen. Paul says this, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. All right, we can pause right there. He says, be careful how you walk, not as a fool, but as a wise person, because the days are evil. Therefore, don't be foolish but understand what the will of the Lord is. Don't get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, three, three points that Paul makes. Let me bring them out, drive them home, and we're done today. The first point is this. A wise person carefully examines his or her life. Let me say it again. A wise person carefully examines examines their life. Now, notice that phrase. Look carefully how you live. 
the, the verb or, or the verb phrase be careful is, is reflexive. It, it, it has the idea not of examining someone else, but of examining your own life. All right, he's saying this look at yourself, examine yourself. Now, man, we have a tendency to examine everybody else. Have you ever been listening to a preacher and, and your first thought, you know, this preacher's driving home this point and you're sitting back kind of looking around thinking, boy, I hope Tom is listening to him. <laughs> or, or even, I hope my wife is listening to him because he, she really needs what the preacher's saying. Or I hope my husband is listening to him. We have a tendency to examine everybody else's life. And we have a tendency to not examine our own. We see the flaws in everybody else and we fail to see the flaws in our own life. So Paul says this, examine yourself. A wise person does an, a, a self-inventory. A wise person does a self-examination. A wise person does a self-introspection. Let me ask you today, are you growing in your relationship with Jesus Christ? If you're not, something's wrong. Do you love Jesus more today than you loved Him a month ago or, or six months ago? Are you falling more and more in love with Him? Are there any actions? Are there any attitudes in your life that do not please God? A wise person examines his life. A wise person examines her life. Paul says a second thing. He says, a wise person makes good use of his time. Verse 16, make the best use of time because the days are evil. If you have a King James Bible that says it this way, it says, redeem the time. Because the days are evil. It has the idea, the word redeem there actually has the idea of buying, of, of making wise purchases. Just as you go to the grocery store and you, uh, you shop. I saw not long ago, you, you know, Facebook is great because it puts all kinds of things on Facebook. And it shows, it shows how a man shops. And it shows, it shows a map. The man goes in one line to the one store and then leaves and goes home. And it shows, here's how a lady shops. And she goes to every single store, every single one, and then she goes back to the very first store and buys it where the first place she shopped from. Now listen, ladies, don't get mad at me. That was on Facebook. I'm just sharing with you what was on Facebook, all right? All right, what is it saying? A lady, I know my wife shops much wiser than I do. Why? She shops and she finds what? The best deal. That's the word that's used. And Paul says, Purchase your time wisely. Use your time wisely. Why? Because the days are evil. Each and every day, you and I must determine how we are going to spend our time. The third thing he says is this. A wise person is controlled by the Holy Spirit. Notice verse 17. He says, therefore, don't be foolish. Let me pause right there because the word foolish that Paul uses there is one of the strongest words in the New Testament. Here's what the word means. It means someone who is deprived of the ability to think correctly. All right, I don't mean to offend anybody. I have a physically disabled child. The word describes someone who is mentally disabled. Someone who doesn't have the mental capacity to make right decisions. Someone who, who will put their hand in the fire because their mind doesn't understand that fire will burn them. Someone who is deprived of the ability to think correctly. Paul says this, don't be foolish. A wise person is able to discern what the Lord wants them to do. And that can be applied so many different ways. You're at work and a coworker begins to tell an off-color joke. 
as a believer, how do you respond to that? Do you respond wisely or do you respond foolishly? Man, it's late at night, wife's in bed, and you're flipping through the television channels. All of a sudden, you flip on something that catches your eye. You know you shouldn't watch it. But at that moment, you're what? You're foolish. At that moment, you're not able to discern that it's not wise for you to watch that. And so you, you keep watching something that is detrimental to you. I wake up on Sunday morning and I sit back and think, man, do I go to church or do I not go to church? Now, kudos to you, you're here this morning, so I'm preaching to the choir. A wise person says, no, man, I need to meet together with God's people. I know it's raining. I know I'd rather stay in bed, but I'm going to meet together with God's people. An unwise person kind of flips over and says, no, I don't need that. At that moment, I'm not, I don't have the ability to make a right decision. I wake up in the morning, and do I grab my Bible, or do I grab my iPad and go straight to Facebook? And spend so much time on Facebook that I don't have time to read my Bible. Paul says, don't be foolish. Make wise decisions. Understand what God wants you to do. And then he clearly outlines what is God's will for your life and mine. Verse 18, he says this, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And see, here's the idea. God gives us the Holy Spirit to make wise decisions. In and of ourselves, we don't make the right decisions. We always, we lean towards the left. The Holy Spirit pushes us towards the right. We lean towards incorrect decisions. It's the Holy Spirit of God that enables us and empowers us to be who God wants us to be. So Paul says, do you want to be wise or you want to be foolish? If you want to be wise, you do what you want to do. Or excuse me, if you want to be foolish, do what you want to do. If you want to be wise, submit yourself to the Holy Spirit of God and allow the Holy Spirit to guide you and direct you. Paul says, here's Paul's admonition, don't be a fool. Anybody ever grew up watching the A-team? Remember Mr. T? Pity the fool is what he always say. Pity the fool. Talk about the person who makes dumb decisions. Basically someone who did something to him and he was just about to go out and beat the tar out of him. Pity the fool is what he would say, all right? Pity the person that makes an unwise decision. Hey, listen, God desires for us to be wise. And he gives us guidelines in our life to do that. Are you wise this morning or are you foolish? Obviously, as I mentioned, we don't have the power to do it ourselves. And, and the ultimate Mark read or, or uh, Eddie read there in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 that, that you know, the wisdom of this world doesn't, doesn't jive with the wisdom of God. The gospel doesn't necessarily connect with the wisdom of the world. What does he say? We need Jesus Christ. Wisest thing you can ever do in your life is not invest 15% of your income in a 401k. The wisest thing that you can do with your life is give your life to Jesus Christ and allow the Holy Spirit of God to guide your life. 